It is a huge honor for me to be interviewing my buddy that I met at the uh, Mega Gen Symposium in New York City. I can still remember sitting there at the bar with you uh, half the night. We had a blast. Uh, Dr. Raj Bath. And uh, my gosh, you are an accomplished oral surgeon. I mean, from A to Z, you are a, uh, you're, you're, you really are an amazing man. Well, I got to hang out with you more often, Howard. Uh, you're uh, good for my ego, but I don't know. <laughs> oh, I don't dude. know about that. I'm trying I mean, to uh, do here for you. I'm going to read your good bio. Uh, Dr. Bass spent his childhood years in Warren, Pennsylvania before completing his studies in chemistry and biology at Aries Gannon University. Dr. Bath earned his DMD from Case Western University in Cleveland, where he received the AAOMS Excellence Award in Oral Surgery. Did you know Cena Soraya when he was at Case Western? You were about the same year, Sam. Uh, no. You know who I did know is um, uh, Rick DePaul. Oh, you were just okay. Talking about him a little bit ago. Absolutely. Yeah, he and I were buddies. Don't 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 mention Rick DePaul or I'll start getting hungry. <laughs> no kidding. He then he complete and... he then completed his oral maxillofacial surgery residency at University Hospital of Cleveland and Mount Sinai Medical Center. Now Mount Sinai, that's in New York City, right? No, no, there was a Cleveland branch there that uh, was uh, Mount Sinai Medical Center as well. Okay, where you were the chief resident. You're certified by the Ohio State Dental Board to provide training to other doctors and surgeons in the field of oral and maxillofacial surgery and lectures frequently both at the local and national levels, yet has never built an online CE course in oral surgery for Dental Town. I told you I'd get to that. I oh actually my got, uh, God. I've got my little notes sitting around ready to do that. <laughs> I apologize. No, no, I can't wait to see it. You know why I can't wait to see it? Because, Bath, I've, I've lectured, you know, all around the world. And, and in the United States, they want to hear about CBCTs and lasers and CAD cams and all that stuff. But when I'm in Africa, Asia, and South America, they mostly need oral surgery skills. And uh, so um, that, that, and that course, uh, that, that'll, that'll probably teach more people how to extract teeth in Africa than it will in the United States. Hey, wherever it works, here, there, or anywhere, it's a little principles that I kind of put together. I kind of call it my bath 90 degree technique. So that's, a, that's the first one I'm planning on doing for you. Oh, I really appreciate it. And you know what? It's also when, you know, cosmetic dentistry, for 2 million dentists around the world, cosmetic dentistry is how do you make a flipper or a partial or a denture? And uh, I've seen um, I've seen girls look in the mirror and start crying when some dentist in Tanzania uh, made her a flipper for a missing right. tooth. And the Americans think a cosmetic uh, course is you know veneers, veneers, veneers. And it's like they they forget that America is five percent of the planet. And, yeah, no uh, kidding. Sometimes you know, we take little things like that for granted, don't we? I know, and but you know how hard it is for me to get a doctor to make an online CE course on how to make a flipper. And then, and then if they do little things like take an impression and make it outside of the math, you, you just tripled the cost for this thing. I mean, I, I want to find some unicorn that can make a flipper in the mouth. You know, how do you use the mouth as the model, create the flipper, all this, because you can change a little girl's life in Ethiopia and Somalia um, and Kathmandu with a, you know, so I, I'm, 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 I always look at the rich countries to find the smart people and then try to use the internet and the iSmartphone app and all that to transfer this wealth for free uh, to the less advantaged. It's kind of like, you know, when, uh, when you get off the elevator on the top floor, you know, any decent human should send the elevator back down to the bottom floor <laughs> right. to pick up the three billion earthlings who live off three dollars a day. You mean you don't hit all the other buttons as you go? <laughs> so so you there's so many things you can talk about. What what do you want to start with? You want to talk about that lip six, lip ob augmentation yeah. and zone classification system for fillers sure. to sure, help sure, teach sure. patients and communicate with the team. What's all that about? Well, uh it's uh something in the in the cosmetic aspect of my uh, practice. I um when my, when my with... patients want fuller lips, I just punch them right in the mouth. Uh, I don't know how you get away with that, but <laughs> somehow looking like me, uh, I'd probably get in double trouble. And why, why uh, is that? Explain that. Look at you. Why, why is that? Well, you know, I mean, uh, one, uh, the the practicing uh, right now with a turban and a beard, that's uh, obviously uh, a little bit more challenging and it, well, so it runs into some stuff. So that's the religion Sikh, S-I-E-K? Right. S -I -E -K? No, S-I-K-H. S-I-K-H. I'm sorry I didn't spell that oh, right. Yeah. Man, that's okay. and, that, and that's a huge religion in Asia. I mean, in, like in India alone, there's is it like 
a hundred million or how, how many yeah, Sikhs yeah, are there? We're actually the they're actually the we're the fifth largest um, uh, organized religion in the world uh, ahead of Judaism, but a lot of people don't know about it. We don't really actually have a organized uh, um, organized uh, conversion process or uh, you know active need to kind of get out there. That one of the principles is, is that if you're uh, a good whatever you are, Christian, uh, Muslim, or uh, Jew, be a good one at it, and that's basically it. So, it, so what, what are the top five? If, if Sikh is five, what's one, two, uh, three, four? It's like uh, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and uh, Buddhism. Yeah, um, and that that is true. That that you make the top five, and and Sikh, you said there's a hundred million, something like that. Yeah, and and uh, do you know what six, seven, eight, nine, ten is, or? No, I mean, yeah, I I thought we were going to talk about. <laughs> talk about I would have I would have studied a little bit more, bowed up on that. You know, you know, religion is uh, is a. Um, I I always study religion and um, politics in the sense that it's at the end of the day, um, we're all just trying to manage people. And my yeah. book is manage uh, uh, uncomplicated business, manage people's time, money, and right. religion tries to do it and get everybody to get along, and government tries to do it, your family tries to do it, and in my MBA, it's trying to get the, the dental office to do it. And just managing your relations with other people is 90% of the game of your whole existence on earth. And, and, and that's the skill that that's dentists That's kind of what I try and do when, when, I, when I'm, if I run into something. I kind of diffuse it from the standpoint of using humor or just education, uh, you know, uh, field all questions, that kind of thing. Yeah. I, I'm the one that should be wearing the turban, cover up my bald head. <laughs> hey, I could be too, you know. You know, you know. <laughs> so, so let's talk about lip augmentation and uh, sure. what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, I think, you know, I think we've kind of let ourselves go to the point where we're okay with um, almost being uh, a, a human comic. Uh, we've gotten to the point where we've got two lips that look like big giant fingers. So I was trying to figure out ways to educate patients because – they come in and I don't know that they really know what they want. They just saw, uh, you know, uh, insert favorite actress here, uh, Angelina Jolie is one that comes up frequently. Um, so, you know, hey, give me lips like hers. And much like, uh, you know, I know you and I were talking, you're a TV and movie buff too, but, uh, you know, if you remember back when uh, uh, Gilligan wanted to fix his broken nose, he yeah. thought he could pick, pick whoever's nose he wanted and, uh, that's not really the case. You got you got to use what you have there to build from that standpoint. And uh, when you're talking to patients about anatomy and anything from dentistry on, uh, you know, you have to try and uh, describe it in layman's terms to be able to be effective at it. And I wanted to be quick as well as effective. So I broke everything down into about six zones, and I used the oral quadrant system. And uh, so it basically comes up to one, two, three, four. And then the uh, uh, pre-maxillary kind of uh, lip tubercle uh, in the upper, uh, and you use that as five, and then the upper zone ab above the upper lip, because I think that's one thing that people don't pay enough attention to. So that segment right there, that five and six segment, made, I think, the, the best uh, results out of everything. So now I can actually tell patients, hey, you know, you're actually asymmetrical, and I can point to and say, hey, zone one right here, I don't have to say your upper right lateral uh, lip is, uh, you know, a little bit askew to the right. And, you know, so it just makes it a little bit simpler. Just go, hey, one, two, three, four, five, six. Most patients can count to six as they walk in the door. So it makes it a little easier for us to just progress on. And then also discuss it with uh, uh, assistance uh, as well as note taking. And and is this something that oral sur what what percent of oral surgeons are doing? Um, th this is lip dermafillers. Is that what it's called? Dermafillers. Der yeah, dermafillers. Um, uh, uh, HA fillers. Um, so uh, hyaluronic uh, uh, acid fillers. Basically, what uh, um, everybody's doing. I mean, you know, we've got nurse injectors. We've got dentists that are doing it. Generalists that uh, uh, cosmetic surgeons. Uh, and do you think this is life. something? Do you think this is something that general dentists could be doing or um, in their office, or do you think this is an oral surgery procedure? I'll, I'll be honest with you. you, you got to be willing to get trained in whatever you're doing. I mean, I, who can do it? Pretty much anybody that feels comfortable and feels like they have taken the time to learn uh, what to do. And not only do you do it, but then to do it, it well, uh, manage your own complications, move forward. I mean, everybody, uh, you know, wants to try and expand their horizons, I think, you know. Uh, 
people want to try and give everybody their best foot forward. If we're just looking at the mouth itself um, and everything past the lips, uh, uh, there's as well an aesthetic property as you know. I mean, you know, it starts from the outside and you go in. Yeah, I was reading an article this morning about a uh, dentist in um, England, and he wrote a textbook on how to notice uh, this child has suffered child abuse, and he and that's what he's kind of talking about. That you know, we start looking at the teeth and look what you missed, and you you could have helped this kid realize that you know he's he's getting beat up at home, you know. Right. And, no, absolutely. And uh, so yeah, is it now? Is this always done with Botox? Is Botox and derma fillers go hand in hand, or are these just two separate things? Um, well, there are two separate things along the lines of ones, uh, well, they're both in the category of injectables, but at the same time, Botox is more of a neuromodulator. It's something that uh, uh, will help um, be able to kind of control muscle function uh, so that we can kind of decrease that function from creating the, the wrinkles that we don't want. Um, both together, obviously, compound the result and, and get a uh, much more uh, aesthetic uh, outcome as opposed to just one. You can't just, you know, keep blowing people up and make their lips so big that, uh, well, great, there's no wrinkles, but at the same time, you know, they've got two big fingers for lips. I'm, I'm trying to think of that cartoon show, uh, um, Homer Simpson, the the Simpsons. Right. I swear, I swear, I I'm not making this up. I was in a flying home, and the lady next to me, when she looked straight ahead, I mean, she looked like a duck. Yeah, well, that's I mean, you know, that's actually something that I have in uh, in my lectures is, is the fact that you know uh, everybody's willing to be a caricature nowadays. You know, in their um, Facebook pictures, you know, they're all peace sign and all kind of uh, giving them the little duck lips, and you know, and that's actually one of the pictures in my lectures. You know, no ducks. So, is this something that you could be trained and get up to speed online, or is this something you need to go to a hands-on course? I think really, to be honest with you, you can start learning about it online. I think nothing is as good as uh, getting hands-on experience, you know, and again, it comes down to do the due diligence and, and get yourself to that level before you start to experiment on your own patients. You should um, you should create an online CE course that so they can do all the didactics and then they could go to your office in Cleveland uh, sure. and do the hands-on or you could have a hands-on at townie meeting or something like that for people. Hey, that that'd be do great. That. Yeah. Be glad to. And so, um, but, but what I meant, uh, one of the same fillers and Botox, I mean, do most cases require both, a uh, uh, Botox, Neuro, um, so that it doesn't, um, so their muscles aren't contracting, and a filler, and then the way I understand it, the Botox wears off in six months, but the derma fillers actually kind of stays because it initiates some type of uh, um, histological response, and it starts laying down collagen, and, and it's kind of a more permanent long-term procedure if you keep doing it it kind of stays whereas botox you know you need to freshen it up every six months right and you know i mean just remember botox because we're affecting the muscle function it's also going to be kind of like you know uh, once that muscle atrophies or the the habit of um puckering or those kind of motions that create those uh, lines uh become uh less common then yeah the botox will potentially be spaced out farther and farther. Usually the average is about three months uh, to begin, but uh, if you stay regular with treatment, you can get uh, longer and longer uses out of it. With filler, it depends on what kind of filler you're using as well as where you use it and how you use it as to, uh, there's a company now, you know, that um, uh, has a filler for um, outside of the lips that we're not we're talking about lips, but you know in cheekbone areas that uh, is supposedly lasts for two years. So, it again those are the kind of things that you can get the didactics down, but then there's certain ones that you don't want to use uh, in certain places because you can develop uh, irreparable damage. And what what uh, brand name fillers and Botox are you using? Is there is there one um, company you like the most or? Or is it really. kind of I mean, generic? I, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm kind of like a fan of all because I, I like to get the feel for what different things, uh, how their function and use is in the sense that um, it's kind of like implants. Again, I've got about experience with about 33 different types. So I've actually used all kinds of fillers. Uh, in the lips at one point, Restylane was the only one that had the um, – lip uh, uh, approval for FDA uh, and then uh, I think Allergan just came up with Juvederm as being allowed to be used in the lips now 
So, um, but there's a whole host of products, and again, you got to know where to use them, how to use them, and when to use them. Now, my my experience with dentists is, um, you know, I, I, they, you call it a, a mentally, emotionally anchoring. Um, you know, they'll they'll go to the Pinky Institute for six weeks to learn, you know, TMD and TMJ and 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 or treating the worn dentition and you know all this stuff. And then I look at their their production, and it's not even one percent. And right. um, so is this is this like a, a fun and games rounding error to your business game? I mean, is this like one percent of revenue, or is this a real deal? I mean, is this five or ten percent of your of you your mean, personally for me? Yeah, personally, for your business. yeah, absolutely. We what we actually did is I I didn't want to be a salesman, so I I kind of took that aspect of my practice and actually moved it out of it because I didn't want you know uh, Timmy's mom to come in and while we're talking about Timmy and making it about mom. Hey, did you know we also do this? So we actually broke it out, and it's it's a separate entity altogether. It's actually it's a, its own um, separate entrance in the in the office, a building, separate office space, the whole nine yards. So yeah, it is. I mean, but you you have three oral surgery clinics, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so with it, does each of the three oral surgery clinics have a separate entrance for this deal, or is this just in yeah. one location? This right now it's just in one location. Um, we've got uh, three different offices. Uh, I'm kind of a little bit a glutton for punishment. Uh, I'm running around between all four, but uh, we're in uh, dire need of a, an associate. So if you know of anybody, let me know. But you're looking uh, for yeah. an oral surgeon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one that uh, you know, somebody that uh, has got their niche down and and wants to do certain stuff. I mean, you know, we don't all have to be. And super. that's and that's in the city of um, Columbus, Columbus, Ohio. Columbus. So you went to dental school in Cleveland, but you went to Columbus. Yeah, I actually, I kind of, I mean, when I was young and 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 stupid, I thought, you know, hey, I wasn't married, and don't have any real ties. I might as well try and see about where I want to go. I actually interviewed all around the United States and uh, ended up in Kentucky of all places for a year, and then slowly moved my way back to to the roots in in Ohio. My sister's in uh, in Cleveland. Uh, her and her husband are both uh, general dentists up there, and uh, you know, we got a whole bunch of family that uh, is all in the dental field. So your wife's a dentist. No, 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 not my wife, my sister. Oh, your sister's a dentist. Yeah, yeah. My, well, my wife actually uh, runs the uh, cosmetic practice. Well, you know, most I, I think most people don't understand that last names used to mean occupation, like Smith was a blacksmith, right. and right. Uh, my last name, Faran, in Arabic means baker. And when you go around the world and you, you study business, it's, it's, it's most people live in a nuclear family. And they've been, it doesn't matter if they're goat herders or dentists, they, they go back generations. I mean, I have been in houses in India and Brazil where there were 25 living dentists in the current family and right. some, sometimes all of them in one house. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, that, that, well, you know, you got to look at how the family units have changed as we've uh, evolved well, into different cultures. But I think they've just mostly changed in about 20 countries. I think out of the 200 countries, I think about 180 are still big into nuclear families and occupations run deep into families and pedigrees that date back. No, I agree with you totally. And, and again, you know, you, um, uh, there's that uh, love of the, f the familiar, you know. Yeah, and look at, look at Kevin Coachman, one of the most famous cosmetic dentists on earth in Brazil. I mean, I mean, almost everybody in his family, every uncle, cousin, nephew, niece, they're all dentists or lab techs. And he actually started out as a lab tech, then he got talked into dental school. I mean, you know, just, I, I, I think, and what's also interesting is the nuclear family in the arranged marriage has only a 9% divorce rate. And then in yeah. the Western 20 countries with love marriages, it's a half divorce rate. But in those 20 countries, if a postgraduate, uh, like a dentist or a lawyer, if two dentists marry each other, they only have a 9% divorce rate. So it shows you the nuclear family's a lot smarter at fixing you up with a woman uh, than you going out you know, at the club and finding some girl that looks hot in a pair of Levi's. Right. Uh, and, well, uh, that's because you next time you go to the club, there might be another hot pair of Levi's running around. So yeah. you know, you never know when you're going to run into that. Yeah. So that, that that's amazing. So so is the is the average oral surgeon today um, revenue oh, revenue about seventy percent exodontia, thirty percent implantology? Would you say that's still the norm, or do you think it's shifted to sixty percent? No, I, I would say you're pretty pretty close to there, just simply from the standpoint that. Um, um, you know the the general um, oral maxillofacial surgeon pretty much you know exodontia and implants or the teeth and titanium thing is predominantly what um, 
weighs heavy with what we do. Uh, there's a, a big shift, you know, with the dual degree, uh, with the fact that even the single degrees are doing uh, much more on the large case basis. Um, you know, uh, I met uh, a little while ago, I was uh, uh, lecturing at ACOMS, uh, American College of uh, OMS, um, uh, a doctor who's a single degree that just does, does vascularized flaps for cancer surgery, you know. So uh, it, it, the neat thing is, is what we do, whether it's general dentistry or it's oral maxillofacial, we actually have a very broad area of what we can do, what we're trained at. And, uh, but, you know, th those are the bread and butters, so to speak. You, you know, it, you know. I look at the nine specialties, and I, you know, I think pediatric dentistry would be the worst. I mean, I just, you know, I I quit if I had to work on three year olds. But my my favorite is still exodontia. I I, I have more fun pulling out four wisdom teeth than anything I do. Yeah, um, no, it's and fun. that's just. And I I think part of it's just the instant satisfaction. It's done. Right. And like, I, I look at it as a puzzle too. I mean, you know, sometimes you run into certain things. How would I, how would I do this? Uh, you know, the the. Probably the simplest and best way that you could probably teach somebody about taking out teeth is uh, an old attending of mine um, pretty much uh, threw out a box of donuts on, on a table when he was lecturing to us and said, uh, okay, I'm going to make a hole in the top of this box. Now you tell me how you can get the donuts out. And the hole was just enough to kind of get adequately access to the, the donut inside. And, uh, and we all kind of looked at him, weren't really sure what he was getting at. He goes, it's real simple. He goes, you either make the hole bigger or you make the donut smaller. Class dismissed. Let's go hit, hit the bar. So that was you know, in the 20, easiest way to try and remove teeth. In 28 years of having associates, um, every single time they couldn't get a tooth out and I go in there, I just look at it and say, well, you know what? I couldn't get it out either. I yeah. have no idea what you're doing. And then you just spend two minutes making the flap bigger and pop it out. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the old axiom, uh, you know, uh, a, a, an inch long flap heals the same speed as a half inch long in a flap. But you know what I've noticed, just throwing some MBA analysis out there on you, is um, when I find oral surgeons that are like 80% um, exodontia and 20% implants, their overhead's about 40%. And when mm -hmm. I go to an oral surgeon's office and they're 70% or, or 30, 40% implants, uh, the, their overhead is uh, maybe 50 or 54, or 55. So, I, so I, I think that's a very interesting analysis for all dentists and oral surgeons to think about that. Their implantology is a higher overhead operation than ex exodontia. I mean, I mean, pulling teeth. I mean, what do you, I mean, I almost do 90% of all my extractions is just a periosteal and a small elevator. I mean, you know. Well yeah, no, I, I will tell you, uh, when I analyzed it, uh, and geez, these numbers are from back in like 2004. But, um, you know, it cost me $700 effectively to put in an implant. Uh, and uh, before even, you know, by the time we get started, um, all the hardware, et cetera, the, the staff time. And then it takes probably somewhere in the neighborhood, depending upon what medications you use to put a person to sleep, between uh, 50 to to $100 to, to um, take out a set of wisdom teeth. Yeah, so so a lot of a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm charging a lot for these implants. It's like, dude, you have a lot of training and hardware and and kits and surgery kits and all this stuff, and they never, you know, you, you people time and money, they they never watch the money. They they you make some sell some watch numbers, they never watch numbers. But rule of thumb is, you know, when when you do a crown for a thousand, that's just half gravy. When you do a root canal for a thousand. That's just easy half grade. I mean, those are probably 40% overhead procedures. Pulling wisdom teeth, probably 40%. But you start getting into implantology, and it's a lot higher overhead than anybody realizes. Oh, no, absolutely. And not only that, but, uh, you know, there's uh, more room for error, um, patients, uh, expectation management. I mean, there's a lot of stuff uh, from the psychological aspect goes into it, too, not just a monetary investment. You know, when, when I... Uh, when I saw that I was interviewing you today, I was so excited because the, the question that I can't wrap my mind about is, and maybe you're probably the only one smart enough to know who's not on the inside. Look at Danaher, the largest dental company in the world. Well, they're not yeah. all dental, but why would they buy the top line Mercedes $500 Noble BioCare and the Southwest Airlines Implants Direct? Why, what, what is the thinking of having are they just looking at like General Motors? We want to have a Chevy, Pontiac, Olds, Buick, Cadillac. You know, I, I, you know, not, you know, I, I kind of like talking about stuff like this. But as far as what were they thinking, I don't know. But as far as what can I extrapolate, I would probably say that you know, 
You're looking at exactly what you're talking about. Um, but, you know, Southwest Dental, I mean, you know, they had the wide body implants uh, that go to like eight millimeters. Um, they have the um, Nobels, which, you know, fit the rest of the, the general um, population of what implants uh, kind of do. Uh, I think, you know, what we've seen, if you remember back from the beginning, implants have kind of bottlenecked. You know, everybody had their little niche kind of thing, and then everything kind of came down. And there's only a few things that are left, basically, between, well, we have, there's mini implants, and then there's, you know, the, the regular size from 3.5 uh, to, to 6 millimeter implants, and then you've got to have a wide body just in case. And that's the only thing I can think of. I don't know if it's necessarily a... Um, uh, a Cadillac GM and, and Chevy kind of thing, but maybe a uh, SUV sports car and, uh, uh, you know, uh, run-of-the-mill uh, station wagon or, you know, soccer mom van. But, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons that I, you know, we met at the Megagen conference, one of the reasons I like Megagen, I uh, have lectured for them in the past, um, but they kind of fit the whole gamut. They've got a little bit of something for everything, and I really just kind of, uh, appreciate that part of their line of implants. Uh, although I use anything that the uh, specific referring doctor requests, uh, those are my go-tos. Just simply because, uh, for some from stability standpoint, um, I mean I can probably do some chin-ups on those guys when you put them in. Take a tooth out, put an implant in. You know, there's always that possibility. Gee, there's a little bit of motion. Hopefully, we'll pack bone around it and keep it stable. But with them, I've I've rarely ever not been able to put in an implant and really feel secure with it. Well, here I go again asking a rich country question. So I want I want to say you know when I look at the the download on iTunes, there's like 206 countries checked off. So I, I want to I want to think of the the whole world right now. And my next question is to say, um, what low hanging fruit uh, tips can you give on routine exodontia? Where what? Where, where do you think general dentists are getting in, in trouble around the world? We just talked about, you know, a lot of times flap. They, they can't see what they're doing. Um, right. get, um, talk, talk to a 25-year-old dentist uh, in Tanzania uh, who sometimes has trouble uh, extracting uh, number 29. And this is a great way to go uh, with the conversation because you definitely did hit the uh, uh, nail on the head. When I was uh, a resident, one of the things that uh, – uh, the students would come in and say, hey, Dr. Bath, can you help me with this? Uh, the tooth just broke off. And uh, my first question to them is, what'd you do? Because I want to know, when I get there, uh, did you really reflect a flap? And when you would get there, you'd see the papilla just kind of pushed out of the way. And development of a flap or reflection of a proper flap, you have to see what you're doing, just like you said. And I think to some degree, uh, there's some um, uh, level of discomfort and worrying, gee, am I doing this right? Am I uh, reflecting this properly? Is it really necessary for me to do? And in, in, in that aspect, yes, it is. The next thing is, is then once you got the visibility, then you've got to go for, just like you said, you got to reassess what I call purposeful motion. You have to basically make sure everything you're doing should be moving you forward. If you just kind of are wiggling and trying to see if anything helps, uh, that's not really doing you any good. If there's bone that's around it, you need to have a plan. Am I going to put the root uh, to the distal? If that's the case, what kind of bone is there that's uh, on the distal? If it's uh, not moving, then you need to try something. And that's where my 90 degree technique kind of comes in that I hope to uh, kind of uh, explain in a, in a townie CE is the fact that if you start looking at it, and gee, I've always been working in this plane. My goal has always been if you literally shift your viewpoint and work in a 90 degree plane and do something different in that plane, usually you'll have some sort of success. From the standpoint of if you have a route that's this way and you've been kind of trying to push it distal, sometimes you just have to cut it from a uh, buccal to lingual section, split the two, and then take it out in two pieces. Uh, if it's something like ankylos, then you have to be comfortable with a... Uh, uh, a uh, a periotome and being able to get between the bone and, and the root. So, you know, there's a lot of things, but it's kind of like that um, challenge that I was telling you before. It's, it's like taking out or uh, taking on a puzzle. You have to kind of almost know what you're doing when you're looking at the x-ray. Well, when I see this x-ray, this is what I'm going to do. And, um, you know, with the advent of cone beams, sometimes you're fighting a root that you didn't realize, but it's curved this way. Well, we've got 
up, down, we've got left and right, but we don't have front to back. And you take a look at it in the three-dimensional, and all of a sudden you see this big giant hook it looking at you. And G, pushing it one way or the other is never going to work. So you have to actually think about rotating it out. Again, those three-dimensional viewpoints um, use our tools. You know, we don't necessarily always utilize that. Sometimes we have to stop and uh, take an x-ray and say, hey, where do I have bone that still may be obstructing what I'm doing. You know, sometimes you got to take a step back and before you move forward. And you probably have to have the most profound anesthesia for oral surgery as opposed to a filling. So are you a... That would help. Are you a lidocaine man or are you a septicaine man? Uh, I will tell you right now, um, I am a lidocaine and marcaine man first. Um, one of my old attendings, Dr. Hauser, used to always say, hey, listen, when you've got... Um, your arsenal all used up up front, then you don't really have anything to go to. And and I used to start looking at that in pretty much a lot of what I do. Um, when you um, create a local anesthetic block and you do get profound anesthesia and you're not quite getting what you need, then you've got something to go to. Let's go ahead and use the um, septicane. Now, my theory on septicane and uh, is, again, if, if you're using it right off the bat and you're using it for a block, you know that... Uh, just as well as I do, you know, there's a, a risk for uh, permanent lingual nerve uh, injuries. And my theory on that is, and so far, knock on wood, haven't had that happen permanently from that uh, perspective. And I think it is anytime I've ever started to inject, and if I was using septicane, I would stop if the patient ever complained of any kind of discomfort on injection, especially when they feel the little electricity in the lip or the uh, tongue. I think the injury to the myelin sheath is where uh, the caustic nature of septicane kind of comes into play. Uh, I don't have any, you know, research-based evidence to kind of back that up. However, I do have multiple times wherever that's happened, I just use the lidocaine and, and marcaine combo. And, and again, I'm not just using bunches of the same thing. Lidocaine has one effect, marcaine has a longer effect, uh, and, you know, compounding the two makes sense. Um, so I usually start with that, and if I have to go to the septicane, that's what I use. Now, in, in infections, um, uh, I will usually jump to a uh, septicane right away just simply because the architecture of, you know, the, the infections change the, uh, the environment and the pH. Okay, and a lot of dentists are, are stressed about um, pain meds because some, some of our peers put downward pressures on any form of hydrocodone, and then yeah. some patients are like, but, you know, the Motrin didn't work. Or what, what, what's your go-to post-op? And what, what, what's your thoughts on hydrocodone versus ibuprofen? Or, or you know, talk about that. Sure. I, you know, I actually, uh, we have a whole sheet uh, that we give patients and we, and we do uh, patient education on that. Is, is If you can use it uh, in an alternating fashion, that's even better. Uh, and in reality, the hydrocodone just basically drugs you up so you don't care. It's really the Tylenol and the ibuprofen that's really doing the pain management uh, and the rest of it's to take off the edge and maybe a little bit of the anxiety and does it work as far as pain control? Sure. But at the same time, I think when you're um, just jumping to, you know, MS cotton, uh, I look at it as we have to find the cause and if the cause is a traumatic extraction, very rarely do I go to a Percocet type thing. I've never written for MS Cotton, um, but at the same time, if we alternate and maximize the effect, you got three hours of this and then you take a dosage of uh, the alternate uh, medication, you got three hours of another. Um, so, you know, again, compounding uh, uh, the effects of two were actually in my eyes is what I'd like to do. That's interesting because you like to compound lidocaine and marcaine. Mm -hmm. And lidocaine short-acting local anesthetic, and marcaine's long-acting. Is that correct? You know, say? Yeah. And then you like, and then and um, and I, I agree with you on the oxycodone or the hydrocodone making you not care because I've only had severe pain in my life three times, and they were all three at kidney stone. And it was the funniest story because the first time it ever happened to me, I forgot how old I was. Water. I, I was I was about thirty years old or whatever, but uh, I showed up to the emergency room and. Um, and the emergency room doctor looked like she could have been my own daughter. I mean, she, she couldn't have been 25. And she goes, oh, she goes, you poor thing, you have a kidney stone. And I just look at her, and I'm, I'm holding my left flank. And I'm like, how do you know it's a kidney stone? And she goes, it's the only thing that makes a grown man cry. And I'll never forget, she gave me morphine, 
and I could mm -hmm. still feel the knife in there twisting, but you just you didn't care. But but along with the the, the deals, um, um, especially for uh, um, countries that don't have hydrocodone available, um, go through Tylenol, ibuprofen, or aspirin. Which one do you think they should be using if they're if they're in a town and they don't have um, a pharmacy um, you know, or hydrocodone? Just to kind of review a little bit, you know, the, um, with the effect of uh, ibuprofen and uh, you know we found that uh, to some degree that does inhibit uh, some healing so you know you know long-term use of that right off the bat is um, you know to some degree for what we're using not necessarily going to cause a long-term problem but when you're talking about um, uh, overshooting the, the pain threshold then I usually shoot for like about 600 milligrams of uh, ibuprofen to 800 milligrams every uh, six to eight hours and uh, compounding that with, if you're using, uh, you know, hydrocodone and, and acetaminophen mix, then about three hours later, um, you know, uh, redosing with with about 500 milligrams of um, hydrocodone or 650 now because there are 325s and uh, five milligrams of hydrocodone. So when you're uh, trying to alternate, it's at least, if nothing else, uh, compounding the two effects, uh, the different pain receptors. And uh, ultimately, you know, you have to kind of also make sure the patient kind of knows where their pain's coming from. Uh, just like your kidney stone, uh, you know, the pain doesn't pass until you pass a kidney stone. So if, if I'm that person there poking them in the shoulder with a sharp stick, uh, they're just not going to care because they're on high on Percocet and morphine or MS cotton. And uh, you, you keep saying ultimate, MS, MS cotton. What, what, yeah. is that, is MS cotton, is that oxycontin? Yep. But, but, yeah, but what's MS cotton? Is that the brand name yeah. or? No, it's, yeah, I think it's a brand name that's uh, basic. Uh, uh, it is the brand name that was being really abused a lot in uh, emergency rooms. MS um, cotton. Yeah. The, the times whenever, when I was a resident, the only times I really actually saw that used were cancer patients and, um, and, uh, and ER patients. I want to uh, ask, I want to ask another stressful question. I feel so honored to have a, an accomplished board certified oral surgeon with three offices and all that. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm just trying to rattle through so many questions. That I know so many of these young kids are thinking podcasts are devoured mostly by young, young people. I mean, it's not an old man sport, you know, uh, although I have gotten, I have to admit, I have got, I did get three emails yesterday by guys saying, Hey, you always say it's young kids on the phone. I'm 61. Another one was said, I'm 69. And, uh, but anyway, so I had three 60-year-old people yesterday tell me they were big fans of the show, but the vast majority under, a lot of times, Bath, they are, um, Raj, they're looking at a tooth, and it's it's a, a lower molar, it's kind of pericorditis, and some of their brains saying, you know, the best thing to do would just get this thing out and put them on antibiotics. Then part of their uh, uh, training is, you know, what if the infection spreads, Ludwig's angina, I should put them on antibiotics first. Can you be specific? Talk... Talk to a 25 to 30 year old dentist and they're looking at this, you know, there's a flap of tissue over the back. It's a lot of pain. When, when do you say, yeah, let's just finish this off, get them done, take that out, put them on an antibiotic, which antibiotic would you put them on? Or when do you say, no, 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 let's, let's manage the infection first. Let's get them on some antibiotics. And then when would you have them back? 24 hours, 48. Can you talk about that? Because it sure. is a very stressful question for a lot of individuals. Absolutely, no, uh, and perfectly understandable. It's uh, part of what I do every single day in the sense that, um, you know, people are um, always worried about managing the infection. We have to go back to, again, what's the cause? The cause is the tooth and the flap of tissue that pericoronitis is uh, resulting in uh, a, a, a worse possibility, um, a full-blown abscess that could become a Ludwig's, like you mentioned. Um, so when you've got a tooth that needs to come out, uh, if you're not going to do it, then refer it uh, to somebody that will take care of it relatively quickly. Uh, if it is abscessed, uh, you know, then if it's extremely large, you don't wait for it to, to control the infection. The infection at that point is out of control. So you have to get it to somebody that can manage it either in the hospital or otherwise and get them the appropriate IV antibiotics. Now, if it's something that's in the office, hey, a little bit of swelling, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, something that I can handle right now, take the tooth out. Um, you know, put, put them on some Paradox, put a drain in, whatever it's going to require. However, you have to move forward purposefully, again, purposeful motion. What's going to 
get rid of the problem. The problem is the tooth and the offending tooth has to be gone. The infection then later on can be treated by antibiotics and of course the first line of defense with uh, oral infections is the penicillin family, amoxicillin, etc. If they're allergic then you know I will go to uh, clindamycin um, or uh, Cipro if uh, other issues um, come up from there. Um, you know, it comes down to what are you comfortable with. If you're not comfortable, then you need to move it down the street, uh, potentially. Um, but managing it is knowing that it needs to come out. Um, trying to do the old, uh, hey, let's give you some um, amoxicillin, 500 milligrams, TID. You know, either treat the infection or don't. If you're going to give them amoxicillin, great. Give it to them four times a day, sometimes even five. But, you know... Um, you got to get them to the level where the infection is going to be treated. However, you never know what's going to happen. What if it's a resistant infection? So you got to get the source taken care of first. And why do you like amoxicillin more than penicillin? Uh, just a, a little bit more broader spectrum. I mean, I, I don't necessarily like it more. I mean, uh, penicillin, depending upon the degree of the infection, I just don't want to sit around and wait uh, in case it is, uh, you know, uh, penicillin type resistant, a little beta lactamase in there or something. And what what do you what's your response to this post I've seen on Dental Town several times? Uh, I like to give them a uh, um, a gram of, of penicillin and uh, and maybe 800 milligrams of ibuprofen um, before, you know, I even numb them up. So the antibiotics is already in their bloodstream. The the anti-inflammatory is already in their bloodstream. So that when you go in there and do your job, they they think that when the infection spills in the bloodstream, the antibiotics are there. When the uh, you know what what do you think of that whole theory? Perfectly good um, thought process on your part. Um, you know when you've got that uh, available, what happens if they don't? Is it wrong to go forward without uh, doing it? You know you still can uh, get a little bit of septicemia um, from getting. Um, you know, the uh, infection into the bloodstream. So you're not necessarily wrong either direction. If you don't carry the antibiotic, uh, there's no point in writing a pre prescription, run them down to the um, pharmacy, have them take the pain medic or have them take the antibiotic, sorry, and pain medication and then come back in. So, you know, moving forward again, you can always get them started on that, but they have to know, hey, you've got to start this antibiotic as soon as you leave. If there's something that is worse off than that, hey, even if you get that tooth out and you're still a little bit worried, um, either send them for management um, to whoever you use for that purpose or to the emergency room. You know, you have to make sure that you've covered all your bases, uh, not just from a legal standpoint, but from an ethical standpoint. You want to make sure that patient's educated. Half the time, you know, they go, oh, well, I'm going to, you know, send this prescription off to my mail order. Uh, prescription place and you know you never know they're not going to get it for a week I've l literally had that happen before an uh, older lady sent something off in the mail and uh, that you know that was each young in my career so that's where the emphasis comes from you got to educate them now before you send them home and then let's talk about the uh, post-operative complications on uh, dry sockets um, what do you think is it would you do you agree or disagree that they're mostly found in women women on birth control and smokers. Is that, would you say true or false to that? Um, smokers I would agree with. Um, women to some degree, I don't know that I've necessarily personally experienced that. Um, you know, that's also some degree when you see people that say no smokers don't have any issues, it's usually a smoker that, um, that, <laughs> that feels that way. Um, so I think smoking is a big deal. Uh, I think, uh, and and you think it's because of the 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 actual the carbon monoxide, the nicotine, or do you think they're sucking on the cigarette is sucking out the blood clot, and be no difference if they were sucking on a straw on a malt from Dairy Queen? Well, here's the thing, um, you know, the the straw thing we'll get to in a second because I think that's a little bit of a misconception. Um, but the 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 sucking aspect of of smoking, I don't think causes the the dry socket. Um, traumatic extractions, the um, vasoconstriction from um, from the uh, nicotine, the uh, first order of any kind of surgery is the fact that nicotine affects your healing ability. Uh, as far as the straw, now here's the thing. I think the reason that uh, the whole don't use a straw after an extraction came about, you know, it becomes uh, worthy to note. 
was it water that they were drinking out of the straw or was it uh, you know McDonald's triple thick milkshake so what do you I kind of sat down and analyzed it and said hey you know what way back when we told them hey don't eat uh, anything solid you're on a um, liquid diet for a while so guess what What was the easiest way to get some nourishment a uh, milkshake it's cold it's, it's it's refreshing it's you know but pulling that through a straw I think that does then create the possibility of a dry socket um, we actually have a fairly low um, level of dry sockets in our office probably I don't know somewhere like two percent or less and the national average is probably more around seven and I think the main reason is is um, strict in sh uh, post-operative instructions, um, not smoking. Uh, I know that. Uh, we how long do How long do they not have to smoke? I tell them a week, because the thing is, most people go, "Don't smoke for a couple of days." Great. Um, you know, I kind of joke with patients. One of the hardest things I can ask a, a smoker to do is is to uh, not smoke for a week. But the even harder one is is to hold their breath for that week. Because you know the that's just difficult to do. There, it's an addiction. They need that. When do you need that? When you need that rush. When you have that anxiety, and and that helps them kind of calm down. So they want it right away. Uh, so if you sit down, well, you know, don't smoke for a couple of days. You're lucky if they get a couple hours. Um, and I've had uh, patients smoke through their nose, through their fist, uh, any number of different um, methods. I mean, even uh, patients with uh, smoking history through their trach. Um, so, you know, that's a difficult thing to overcome, but I'm usually pretty strict about it. Hey, listen, between three and five days, you're going to get a good chance of a dry socket. Don't smoke for a week. That's not something that I even want you to, you know, um, inhale any secondhand smoke as, as a joke. But in some degrees, I just feel like, you know, in my personal experience, that's been helpful. Um, what else do we do? I mean, we're just gentle with the tissues and... Uh, don't uh, definitely irrigate when you are using a, a handpiece on the bone. Uh, try and do more work. I uh, talked about the uh, making the hole in the box bigger or the donut smaller, and I definitely always try to make the donut smaller because I also feel the parts that the patient has to heal later uh, equates less work for that body to do or less pain. Uh, and when they do have a dry socket, how are you treating that? Um, you know, a lot of times it's it's also a, a, a misconception as to a misdiagnosis. It's not necessarily a dry socket. I've had a lot of luck with uh, doing some physical therapy with them right afterwards. It's more a trismus thing. So we have to kind of find the cause. If we're just dumping a bunch of uh, dry socket paste, uh, you know, balsam of Peru, whatever your uh, eugenol, whatever your favorite thing is. Um, one, you got to remember that, you know, if the nerve's been exposed, that's caustic uh, to the nerve. Uh, second is, is that uh, if you've packed it and they're still not having a problem, well, what else could it be? It also could be that they're gritting their teeth so tight, their muscles are spasmed, and the trismus is so bad they can't even move their mouth. So we've had some good luck about, uh, you know, getting the difference between what kind of pain is it, you know, when does it uh, come about. Oh, well, it wakes me up in the morning. Great. That's, you know, clenching your teeth at night. Wakes me up at night. Same kind of thing. First thing I usually do is say, hey, open your mouth. And if they can't open yawn wide, that's one avenue to start uh, working on is the physical therapy. Um, just packing everything isn't really going to do anything because, again, the, the packing itself then becomes as a, uh, a deterrent to, to natural healing. And I think our body really actually knows what to do. I mean, the big guy upstairs made us in, in a pretty uh, amazing way and sometimes I think we get involved in that healing process a little bit too much and I think that uh, sometimes finding the cause, educating the patient and then moving forward. To, if they need dry socket packing and you literally look in there, you got to know what it is. If there's nothing in the socket you see exposed bone, it's a dry socket. But if you look around in there and there's uh, granulation tissue in there and there's a fibrin coating that's fully covered all throughout the socket, then you got to look at another possibility. And what do you what do you think of dentists who, after they're done with the extraction site, will irrigate uh, with a big syringe of uh, Paradex, and they think that? Uh, is I don't know. I'm, I don't do it, and I don't have any more infections than anybody else. Oh, it sounds you know, like you I have mean, a lot I, less. Seven percent is average, and you only have two percent. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, you know, the, the other thing is, is that uh, you know, putting clindamycin on a on a gel foam um, pack has also been proven 
to help, but I'm not doing that, and it doesn't really necessarily, uh, you know, work in my hands. And if if that works in your hands, great. I think sometimes we talk ourselves into things just because uh, it's uh, so and so does it, you know, and so and so is a big name in in the industry, so I'm going to do what so and so does. But we don't necessarily, again, we we forget sometimes. I mean, you know, um, I get a cut. Uh, it doesn't heal as fast as my little girl's uh, cuts do. Why? We can't treat me like uh, we would treat her. She's younger. Her body's in a different state of um, healing ability, and and mine's in a different. So you got to try and treat the patient, and not try and treat a cookbook. You know, I mean, well, I do this in every single one. Uh, I remember um, uh, there was uh, a person in my school. Uh, she used to tell me about how her husband used to take out teeth. Well, first thing he did was break all the um, periodontal fibers with a 15 blade. And I'm like, why? You know, I mean, there's not necessarily a purpose. First thing that they taught us in um, uh, oral surgery, you got to use an elevator. First, you luxate with an elevator. I'll be honest with you, if I'm taking out teeth and there's plenty of tooth there, I just put a um, forceps on it and take it out. Use the forceps the way it's supposed to. You don't necessarily have to do all these things, and I don't have um, tears in the tissue, and I don't have buckle plate fractures. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, do we have complications, and do those things happen? The more you do something, you're bound to run into something. But at the same time, uh, I think if you utilize the tools in your toolbox uh, properly, you're, you're going to end up, um, you know, having a, a method that works for you and if if you've got to rinse everything else out to make you feel good at night then, then you know more power to you that's fine so you don't necessarily put a elevator around the tooth and de and push back the tissue and then elevate with a small elevator before you you go right to a forcep not always i mean you know it, it, again it, it's it's um you know i, I like using the, the term uh, depends on uh, you know how fast do you drive depends on the situation um, if I'm dealing with a, um, you know, 12 year old who's got, um, four by cuspids coming out for orthodontia, then why am I flexing all those teeth? They're already, you know, a little bit mobile. You're taking, uh, other teeth and luxating them potentially. And in reality, they come out fairly easily, whether they've got the little spindly double roots or they're conical. Uh, you have to kind of be able to almost feel it when you're, when you're taking it out. Um, so do I reflect some flaps usually after that? I mean, even teeth that are broken off at the gum line, uh, sometimes those take a number nine and literally just go right around the root, uh, without reflecting a flap and using my number nine just to kind of core it out and push it out. So why am I reflecting flaps when I, you don't necessarily have to? And again, that works well in my hands, but if you're somebody that says, Hey, I need an inch long incision to do every single one, then great. Just like you said, yeah, an inch long incision heals just as good as a half inch incision. So have you videotaped any, many of your surgeries? Uh, you know, I just started. Um, I, I've been in photography ever since I was a kid, so more um, photos, and I actually I got a digital camera. Uh, when I was a chief resident, the attendings always wanted us to get um, uh, photographic capabilities, and you know, we'd always end up spending all this money on these big giant uh, cameras and SLR type stuff and uh, I was the first one in our um, uh, community to get a uh, digital one and, and so I've, I've started toying around with it. I'll be honest with you, I mean I, I photograph everything um, just for the sake of um, one, being able to lecture about it and two, uh, also being able to look back at what I do. How many lectures do you have? Uh, on tape, uh, like half of one. But, uh, on, but what about uh, on PowerPoint? On PowerPoint, probably some of them were about 20. 20 different lectures? Yeah. And how long are each one? Uh, anywhere from, uh, well, a couple of them are different versions of the same, but uh, uh, anywhere from like taking a two-hour lecture down to 20 minutes. But uh, I have some that are uh, two hours, and most of them are about that hour, hour and a half range. Raj, I would do anything to get those online because I mean I've just been to so many places and they say you know we don't care about we don't care about CERAC and we don't care about CBCT and we we don't we don't care about veneers and bleaching and bonding and you you know I, I remember specifically in Kathmandu and she's like can you give us more you know courses in oral surgery and I I, I can't think of anyone better to do this than you. 
Well, I mean, there's a whole host of people probably they could do it uh, just as well, if not better than me. But no, I'd you're, definitely you're be glad so, to help. And, you're, and you're, just the, you're just uh, humble. You're just humble. No, uh, no. I guess maybe it's just the way my parents raised me. I don't know. Yeah, you're just a humble guy. Um, I appreciate so, that. So what's this XNAV thing you bought? Yeah, so this is actually, uh, I think this is the Oreo cookie thing that you're, you're, you're talking about. You know, the implants and safety. You've got those being the cookies. And, you know, the cream's going to be uh, the thing that holds it together. And, um, you know, uh, the XNAV is basically CT uh, navigation and guided surgery. Uh, kind of put together. It's really actually uh, something that I think is going to be a game changer for a lot of things. Uh, not so much robotic surgery, but it is going to be, you know, CT based where you can literally, um, you know, if you plan out your um, your surgery and your implants and say, you know, now you have to do the CT scan, you got to do the model, you got to send it off to the lab to be, um, uh, to be uh, fabricated into a splint to be able to come back and then use that surgical stent. Um, but there's, you know, some degree of error. There's human error. There's, um, you know, the laboratory error. There's um, the possibility that, you know, you got to remember the CTs are extrapolated. There's some extrapolation error. So any of those things can come into play. Now, these guys have actually come about. Now, there's three of them that are out on the market, but XNAV is the one that's gotten the um, FDA approval first. Uh, they're where, also where, the ones that I... Where, where yeah. are they out of? I believe Philadelphia. It's the um, gentleman uh, Ed. Um, oh, geez, I'm blanking on his name, but Ed uh, actually used to be the one that uh, started out with ICAT um, before he sold it off. Is he so, a friend of yours? Uh, he's getting to be. I mean, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that we're more than just uh, acquaintances. Yeah, I mean, I've got Can you email kind of email me Howard at dentaltown.com and and CC him and say you guys should talk about XNAV? Oh, yeah, no, absolutely, and actually that's one of the other topics that I've got planned to, to do for you is, is that I mean, I plan on jumping on board with these guys and, and uh, developing a whole host of uh, teaching opportunities with them because it, it's really going to be a game changer in the sense that they're um, touting a, a, a two micron degree of error. So if you're putting your implant into the bone, you're putting it right where you need it, and you're seeing real time. If you need to tip your um, implant drill a little bit mesial, a little bit distal, a little bit lingual, it tells you right there. It's, it's almost like a video game. You know, so, you're, so you're watching the screen while you're drilling. Really? Yeah. Huh. I go to the website. It's uh, uh, xnavtech.com. Xnavtech. Tech. T e c h. I think. And you're gonna make us a course on this? Sure. You're gonna be up till midnight tonight, dude. You got you got a lot of courses. I'm gonna you make it put right up. now. No, I'm you're gonna make you, it right now. Patients. Put me but, on the yeah, phone with your good. office manager, and I'll cancel all the rest of your day. <laughs> I'll send all the patients. Home. I got still still got to pay the bills, Howard. Your uh, MBA should have taught you that. You can't uh, pay the <laughs> bills without seeing patients. So um, so then, will this replace the CBCT? Is this XNAV Tech in conjunction with your current CBCT? How does yeah. that work? It's not going to replace the CBCT. It's based off of the CBCT. In other words, we've got um, you know a three-dimensional patient. We've been using two-dimensional uh, pictures to be able to represent what the skeletal uh, rep, uh, skeletal anatomy is. However, we've always you know lost out on that third dimension, and the CBCTs allow for us to utilize it. And we should be utilizing it more. Um, it's been touted as the gold standard for a long time. So if you're doing um, implants, uh, you should definitely be investing in a cone beam because... Do you have one in each of your three offices or do you yeah, follow? Yeah, I do. And, and are they all the same kind? No, actually, uh, I've kind of uh, played around with them. There's, it's just like uh, implant systems. You've you got to kind of find the one that you kind of like. I bought the iCat first. Um, um, my uh, other office is a uh, uh, satellite office that I rent, so they have one. Uh, and that's a, a, a Serona, I think. And uh, then the one that I just got, it, it's uh, a Samsung Guts. Remember that, the Sony Guts thing? But it's, it's, it's uh, Samsung, and it's uh, LED. So, uh, it's I called think a the Samsung on, LED? Well, it's Samsung. It's, it's is the, the Korean. Company it, that, yeah, it's that the Korean the but Yeah, but LED is the one that distributes it. Um, you know, they also uh, distribute the uh, Velscope. 
but uh, um, you know that uh, company is, I think, Canadian based. But uh, at the same time, the picture is amazing. And so, but the new part is, is that you know the Anatomage thing. I, I just like taking those pictures and putting them in the Anatomage. Now, the XNav has their own um, computer software that will be able to help you plan out your surgery. Uh, technically, you can you know import anything as far as die comes from other places, but. Uh, uh, they have the ability to place the implant where you want it um, and then you know the angulation that you want it to make sure you've got the size that you want and you know they're, they're touting a, a, a 0.25 millimeter and it's uh, the first one to be FDA approved for what specifically uh, for uh, guided navigation surgery so um, you know they're um, basically making the whole environment better I mean you know you gotta Believe in, in, in what it's doing and believe in the better because here's what uh, I've heard. I just came back from a national meeting and, uh, you know, the big thing is, oh, man, another thing to kind of make it easier for everybody else to do implants. And that's not really necessarily true because I think that, you know, when we um, uh, try to embrace the technology and embrace what um, we're trying to do, ultimately we're trying to do the best for our patients. And if it um, helps us all sleep better at night when somebody can do something that they didn't necessarily have the surgical skills to, this doesn't necessarily take that and make it that much easier. It actually makes them have to, again, now learn how to treatment plan, um, learn how to um, deal with the complications. Um, you know, what do I do when this doesn't go right? And there's still going to be some degree of human error. I mean, you can't just imagine that the computer is going to do it all for you. We're still dry, the driving force of the treatment plan, where the implant goes. So there's still some knowledge and didactics that have to come into play. And we have ran out of time, but I have to ask you one overtime bonus question just sure. because um, I know they're, they're thinking it. So of all the implant companies, you know, th this dentist is all alone. And my whole mission with Dental Town is that no dentist should ever have to practice solo again with the internet, smartphones. And right. so if you had to pick one implant system, which one would it be? Uh, <laughs> um, that's that's kind of tough because, I mean, again, they've all kind of come to the point of being niche, uh, but they've all kind of started to um, grab from each other, and they're looking more and more uh, to be very, very similar. Uh, well, they give the, a, give a few names then. That I mean, I mean, I like um, I like uh, Megagen. Like I said, they've got actually got a couple host of uh, implants. I think what I like the best is that their concept of trying to get rid of that uh, dieback on the uh, uh, cervical aspect of the implant is that they want to preserve crestal bone. So you have to again be uh, knowledgeable about what the shapes of your implants are and why they're that shape. Uh, the other one that I like, um, you know, I like Implant Direct for the fact that, uh, you know, they've got uh, a whole host of uh, internal connections, a uh, whole host of shapes, and, geez, you know, they've taken into consideration the cost of it. You know, we got to champion implant dentistry. If we really believe and we've commit made the commitment, we've got to try and keep the cost down so it's affordable for our patients. You, ne you never, you never want to make predictions, especially in print or in podcasts or whatever, but I'll, I'll make a prediction. That sure. I feel comfortable about. Jerry Nisnik will never go away. He'll be back. <laughs> he started one implant company. What did he start? Cor Corvent? And Corvent. Sold uh, yeah, was a long it, time ago. Paragon. Yeah, and then and Paragon. And then did he start Paragon? Sold it. I think so, yeah. And then he uh, started Implants Direct and sold that to uh, uh, Kerr, Cybron, Danaher. And, her, and, right. uh, and I swear to God, that guy, he probably sleeps about eight minutes a night. Uh, hey, I'll tell you what, love him or hate him, I mean, he's done a lot for dentistry, and, and he's been very shrewd at what he's done, so and last, success is And success. last, overtime, 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 um, sure. if someone was going to buy a CBCT, you've worked with ICAST, Serona, I assume, Galileos, um, yeah. this um, Korean Samsung Guts that's distributed by LED, you said it's a Canadian company? Uh, I believe so, yeah. Um, if you're going to buy a CBCT, would you buy one, or do you think a dentist should just uh, refer to a radiological center? Um... <laughs> Again, it comes back to how uh, committed are you to what you're doing. If you're really going to start doing implants and trying to get more involved, then yeah, you probably ought to think about buying one. Uh, does it have to be brand new? No, but you need to know how to read them. You need to take the courses. I mean, you just can't just go buy technology and think that you're going to make use out of it or it's just going to sit there. I, I ran into a, a doctor at a uh, aesthetic show one time and um, 
she just kept buying technology and I asked her, I just said, hey, so um, what's your, um, you know, I felt like I was you for a minute. And I started asking her questions about, you know, what's her business run? What's the, you know, overhead? What's this? What's that? But she's like, yeah, but if I had that technology, people will come in. I said, not necessarily. You know, she had just bought a, a, um, a laser that she already had one laser. Now she's got another one. I'm like, what's the purpose? There's an overlap. And so, you know, you got to realize that you got to be able to utilize your technology. You got to be able to know how it does things, why it does things, and how you're going to implement it into your practice. You can't just, just go buy something. Uh, if you do use a, uh, a center to scan your patient, um, you got to still be able to utilize that information. How are you going to utilize it? Are you going to, you know, maybe use it for XNAV, or are you going to maybe, um, you know, still continue on making the, the surgical stents? Um, you know, it's just a matter of putting in the, the due diligence outside of patient time. You got to sit down and really actually plan out what you do. You know, in 1987, I answered, I, you know, if we ever said, if a patient asked something, we said no, they had to track it. That is when we had to make prescription pads and I had a getting to yes prescription pad. And one of the first questions I had to say no to is someone called and said, do you have a laser? And we said no. So I, uh, at lunchtime, I went over to Radio Shack and I bought a laser pointer for each operatory and came back yeah. and put one each operatory. I said, now you tell them, oh my God, Dr. Friend has a laser in every yeah, operatory. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, um, she didn't lie. Raj, uh, uh, thank you so much, man. I, I just adore you. I, th I think you're the nicest, most adorable oral surgeon I've ever met in my life. You're just a hell of a guy. And uh, Thanks, I'm sorry I'm sorry we had to meet, and it wasn't at a fun bar in New York City. God, that was a fun hotel. Damn, yeah, that was hotel a good time. Was, uh, that was a really nice place. Yeah, we'll do it so again sometime. Yeah, I hope so. And uh, um, until I see you again, thanks for all you do, buddy. We'll wait, try and make it short this time. Take care. Thanks a lot. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Okay, we look forward to your courses online. All right, take care. All right, bye-bye.